Why don't we get started? I'm Marilyn Kelly. Many of you know me. I'm now teaching here at the law school, and I'm a Wayne grad. Uh, um, I'm also now proud to say I'm on the Board of Governors of the University, and it's a learning experience for me at this point. I, I was on the bench for 24 years before I uh, returned to my law school to teach. Uh, my last stint was on the Supreme Court, and I had the privilege there of being Chief Justice for two years. So in the course of all that, I've had a chance to meet and uh, learn about a good many judges in this state. And I can tell you from personal experience that you have before you four wonderful women judges. Uh, who set a, a terrific example uh, of the ethics and quality that we need in our judges throughout the state. Um, I'm going to let them talk a little about themselves and give you some ideas, and then we're going to encourage you to ask questions because we know that that's an important thing. This Law School Alumni Speaker Series event, Women in the Judiciary, was established two years ago by Dean Jocelyn Benson, who will come by this afternoon if possible to say a word to you. She did this to help connect students with alumni who've taken a diverse and wide range of career paths, because all four of these judges are alums of Wayne Law. In, 20, in 2014, women made up 30% of all judges of the, in the state of Michigan. That's uh, about 200 out of a total of over 600. Um, in 2015, the Supreme Court of the state composed two women out of seven justices, and the U.S. Supreme Court has three women out of nine, as you know. Today, we're honored to be joined by these women. They're all sitting now uh, working, and uh, they uh, had to leave their courts today to come and spend time with you. Uh, the first to talk with you is Mary Ellen Brennan, Judge Brennan is in the Sixth Circuit Court, which is Oakland County mostly. Uh, Oakland County family-focused juvenile drug court presiding judge right now. She was elected to this highly contentious position. Oakland County is some of the most hotly uh, contested races for judge of any county in the state. Uh, uh, she was elected in 2008. She graduated from MSU Madison, uh, James Madison College, and as I said, came on to Wayne and graduated from Wayne Law School. Uh, she, uh, before taking the bench, was an assistant prosecutor. She was an assistant general counsel for an insurance company. She was an assistant city attorney in Royal Oak and a judicial uh, staff attorney in the 44th District Court. So she came to the job of judge with wide experience. And I'm going to allow her now to pick up and tell you more about herself and give you some words of wisdom. Uh, Judge Mary Ellen Brennan. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, you guys, thank you very much for inviting me here today. I have not been back as often as I should have um, since I graduated in 1990, and I cannot believe how this place looks. Absolutely beautiful. How proud you must be. Um, I did graduate from uh, your school in 1990, and right after graduation, um, went to the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office. One of the things that um, I wanted to make sure that I said, so I'm going to say it first, um, I learned evidence from Ralph Slovenko, Professor <laughs> Ralph Slovenko here. Is he still, is he still teaching? He retired last year. Did he? Okay. Um, there is not a day that goes by in the last 25 years in terms of my work life that I don't use something that he taught me. So I guess that was something I definitely wanted to make sure that, that you knew. Um, that I was Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 8 a.m. <laughs> in a little classroom with him, and there is not a professional day that goes by that I don't use something that Professor Slovenko taught me, and that's the truth. Um, after I worked at the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office for about seven years, I did general crimes prosecution and um, two years in the child sexual assault unit. Um, I started to have a family, and so I decided to make a change and go into the private sector, worked for an insurance company, um, great pay, great flexible hours, and I was absolutely dying. <laughs> I was not stimulated, not happy. Um, it was not a good fit. So I went back uh, into the public sector and started doing some work for the city of Royal Oak, and that's how I uh, kind of finished things out before <coughs> I made the decision to run for judge. I ran in 2004 and lost, and as 
in uh, most things in life that was absolute perfection because I wasn't ready to be a judge and my family wasn't ready for me to be a judge and the timing wasn't right. Um, so I ran again in 2008, was elected, and have happily served um, since 2008. And I'm assigned to the family division, um, which means that I do divorce, child custody, uh, paternity, adoption, juvenile delinquency, those types of things. And one of the things that Justice Kelly mentioned, um, that I preside over the juvenile drug court, that's probably one of my favorite things. That's uh, more of a, that's something that you kind of volunteer for, that's not really part of my work day, those are evening um, type of uh, obligations. speaker will judge Megan Brennan. Megan Brennan is the judge of the Third Circuit Court, which is Wayne County, as you know. She was appointed by Governor Jennifer Granholm in 2005, and she has served in the Family Division since January 2006. She was re-elected in 2006, 8, and 14. So she now has a term, these are six-year terms, you know, in the Circuit Court, that goes to 2020. She um, received her undergraduate degree from Michigan State and her JD from Wayne in 1987. Judge Brennan. Thank you, Justice. I'd like to also thank uh, uh, Dean Benson for inviting me to this event and thank all of you for being here. This is a good show. I really appreciate it. Um, I, as, uh, Justice Kelly said, I went to Wayne, I graduated from Michigan State in 
I applied for a position at the Attorney General's office in 2003, was appointed an assistant attorney general, and I, uh, um, and I worked in the labor division for um, the AG's office. And, and, uh, it, um, it was very broad practice and really great experience. And then I, after that, um, I then I uh, put my name in. I knew I had been contemplating becoming a judge, trying to become a judge, so I kind of put the process in for an appointment and over time that happened and it took time. And I was appointed in December 2005. Um, for the first uh, year of my, uh, Wayne County Circuit Court is very large as you know and we are divided, the court is divided into four divisions and I was uh, with the, the, the juvenile division, the, um, the um, criminal division, the domestic relations docket with and then the uh, civil division. So I've served in three of those four. The first year I was in the juvenile division, um, and then for the next six years I worked in the domestic side of the family court during the past year between the first day. Judge Brandon was in Polk County. The last three years I've been assigned to the criminal docket. So that's been, uh, and I wanted to change from doing family law only for that length of time. And I, for me, I wanted to do broader practices, broader focus. And, and I wanted to do jury trials. So that we do in felony trial docket. It's very exciting and very interesting. I like working with the people, the jurors, and you know, I like to work really felony trials. Um, <coughs> We're not related, but I would claim her. <laughs> <laughs> I should say our husbands actually took the bar exam together yeah. in yeah. the same room and yeah. grew up together. <laughs> and then spent a couple days, I understand, at Michigan. <laughs> well, anybody who doesn't celebrate after cooking, there's something wrong with them. I celebrate it, too. Our next speaker is Judge Nancy Grant, the Chief Judge of the Sixth Circuit Court in Oakland County. I've known her now for years. She was elected in 1996. Uh, she became chief judge seven years ago and has held that position, and I can tell you that's appointed by the Supreme Court. Um, I can tell you what a difficult position it is because there are many judges on the court. They bring with them varying personalities and backgrounds and approaches to the world and to the job. You're such a good political <laughs> I, could, I could say it in, in more no, no, partisan no, 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 no. terms. <laughs> But suffice it to say, it's a, it's a terrible job <laughs> and, and a huge responsibility. And I admire her for hanging in there so long and doing so well with it. Um, she graduated from the University of Michigan with honors. Uh, she graduated from Wayne Law School. And it says in the, in the background I have on you, Judge, Director of Wayne State University Law School Honors Program. Well, it was, at the time, it was a student, uh, you couldn't get out without being an honors program. Advocacy program, which I think has changed in 20 some years. <laughs> it is no longer, but the time is an honest program. Okay. Everybody who's a circuit judge, as she is, uh, belongs to the Michigan Judges Association, and uh, this lady has become president of that. She now is past president of the Michigan Judges Association. So uh, she has statewide recognition and honor, if you will, among her own. She has been a member of the State Bar of Michigan Representative Assembly, which, uh, which kind of work I recommend to all of you. I did too. And, uh, and very impressively, she's the still chairperson? I just got, thank God, I, I just completed. Now I'm just a regular. Okay. <laughs> a member of the Judicial Tenure Commission. And you know what the Judicial Tenure Commission is, right? Right. <laughs> This is the august body of judges and others who are responsible for disciplining judges and sometimes recommending that they be removed from office. It's an incredibly difficult job because naturally other judges don't welcome the kind of uh, scrutiny they get by the Judicial Tenure Commission if they're accused of having violated the canons of judicial ethics. Um, so here again is a, a, an incredibly responsible uh, job that, that this judge has undertaken for a period now of years. So with great pride I give you Nancy Grant. I'm gonna, 
I am not a yeller. <laughs> so, according to my grown children. So I'm just going to stand up here because he has a microphone. Um, let's see, how did I graduated in the 80s, but I'm not the oldest one here. <laughs> I just said that to Don. I went, oh my God, that's so cool that she graduated before I did. Um, I, 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 all my accomplishments, I say, are completely rooted in this school because when I was here, I was very active in the school um, with the trial advocacy. There was other community activities I'm sure that you all are involved with. And I was able to actually get my first and only, quite frankly, private practice job as a direct result of Wayne State because I was a summer intern and then they offered me a job at Dickinson. Hey, Ashley! Sorry. <laughs> um, that's my personality, believe it or not. All that responsible person, yeah, it's out the window. Um, I, my job, my only private practice job was at Dickinson Wright. Um, I would use to say a very small law firm. No, it's a huge law firm, very prestigious, and it gave me an immense amount of, of help. And, and I don't think I would have done as well there, again, had it not been for my education and the professors here at Wayne State. So I'm grateful to Wayne State. And, I'm, and I guess before I continue, I'm also very grateful that um, Dean, Be Dean Benson asked me to be here. Um, and Wayne State, you should know, in private practice and in the public field is is really very well regarded. So when you are out there looking for a job or just letting people know where you've gone, you say Wayne State and you don't even have to say anything after that because um, your credibility and your and the estimation of how people are judging you go automatically up. I will tell you that from personal experience. Um, I was because I'm also uh, the daughter of a now retired judge, um, he was, my father was in the probate court. When I went to Dickinson, I wasn't a typical associate in terms of, I was never afraid of the judges because I knew what they looked like afterwards. <laughs> so literally the day I got my P number, I was put into court and asked to cover some motions. And within a year of that, I was um, second chair. And within two years of that, I was responsible for my own trial. And if you would have heard anything about law, large law firms, that's almost impossible here a second year associate doing trials. But that was because of, again, the training I got here at Wayne and just being familiar, being comfortable in my own skin. Um, I ran in 96 for the position after actually being encouraged because there was an open seat and because I had been so active um, in the court system, I was actually quite frustrated because I was also given the responsibility of my own clients, um, municipal clients, and I could never understand why I would show up at court at 8.30 because the judge orders you to, and I'm not naming names, but they're not on the bench anymore, but they wouldn't show up until 10, take a break at 11, tell you to come back at 12, and I just thought it was, a, you know, I know that I was working really hard for my clients and I had to build them for my time. Um, so there was a vacancy, I ran really hard for it. Um, I think part of why I was successful, well, I'll tell you this, at the time, um, when I joined the bench, I was one of three women on an 18-member bench. Yesterday, we had a judges meeting. There are now three men on the bench. <laughs> so it's really changed. The, I mean, I, maybe there should be some, a little bit more balance. It should be one way or the other. But, um, but when I ran, I w it, was, it was very unusual for a woman to be running for judge at that time. And I actually think at the time, it was a complete advantage. We didn't realize that. Plus, it was, I had done a lot with my community, and that was the other thing I wanted to encourage all of you. Don't just like go to school, do your work, go home, take care of your families. I was raising, I had married two kids. My, my, both my boys are, one's almost out of college, the other's out. But you can do it all. I mean, I do it well perfectly, but you can do it all. But you have to be involved in your community. You just can't do your work. And if you don't do that, then I don't think personally, and I know these judges would agree, you're not a whole person. And that's something else I believe that Wayne will teach you. So I was very involved. I was elected. Um, at the time, that's how old I am, um, Mary Ellen, that I actually had a family and a criminal and a, and a civil doctor because, and I enjoyed it that way, but then there was, a de there was now a, a division um, among all the state trial courts. And I am in the civil criminal division. I've been doing that forever. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, I love my work on the Judicial Tenure Commission. Um, when I ran for it and um, got it, the first thing someone said to me, don't be surprised that when you go to these judges association meetings, that everyone comes up to you and they love you and they think you're great, and then you they turn around and they start talking crap about you <laughs> because they don't know that it's, you know, it's a nine-member panel and we have to do the work that we're charged to do, and it can be really difficult, but it's a really important job. Um, 
I think it's really interesting that Justice Kelly didn't tell you how I became the chief judge is because of Justice Kelly was the chief justice at the time. So technically, while the whole Supreme Court appointed me, she's, she's certainly spearheaded that effort. And I'm grateful 90% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very difficult job. It, it's administrative. It, I mean, I get a lot of um, litigants that will call my chairman and say, I don't like what Judge Brennan is doing. And I say, well, that then you should appeal Judge Brennan because I'm not her, her, I'm not her boss of her, how she's making rulings. There's, I'm there for administrative purposes or budgetary reasons. So I, I overlook it and I, um, and while my colleagues are very kind, they call me judge and they say, well, you're the boss. And I'm really not. I get to sit at the head of the table and I get to run the meetings. And the buck will stop at me for a lot of stuff. But really, it's administrative. I have so enjoyed it, but I mostly very much have enjoyed my work. Um, I think it's important work. I think sometimes attorneys don't get the, you know, I know they don't get the credit that they deserve. And it's an increasingly difficult field. Um, especially, I think all the technology tends to, and I, I just have seen this lately, so I'm saying it. I see, a, because you all have your phone, I have my phone here too. I'm seeing less and less attorneys talking to each other, and I would encourage you to get out of the habit of using technology to do everything, emailing, texting, all that, because I find that when attorneys talk to each other, they're able to resolve their cases, or at least they move their cases along. It's really easy to hide behind the, the printed word. Just that's an FYI, my, my PSA for the day. Um, but that's my background. That is my work. I'm still involved with the community. I love, I love being involved, and I can't believe that you are as young as you all are sitting here. So, some of you. <laughs> so, thank you for the invitation, and I'll be waiting over here for questions. And last, but by no means least, Judge Donna Robinson Milhouse. Judge Milhouse is a district court judge. She's uh, in the 36th district court which, as you know, is in Detroit. It's an enormously busy district court. Um, uh, I can scarcely conceive of how one can do that job day in and day out with the load uh, that the judge gets, the dizzying load of people, and, uh, and the incredible responsibility of real life day-to-day -day problems that have to be handled just like that. So she, she now has... Um, She's a native Detroiter. She was appointed um, to the bench in 2000. She graduated from, get this, graduated on a ten, got a tennis scholarship at Eastern Michigan. I'm an Eastern Michigan grad too, but nobody gave me a scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> and she earned her Bachelor of Business Administration in 81. Her law degree here from uh, Wayne in 84. She then went on and practiced for what is now Clark Hill, and became a partner. Um, then she joined AAA Michigan as an assistant general counsel and continued there until she was appointed to the bench. Uh, she's been enormously active in the community as well as having a family and two children. Right? Um, she, um, she's been vice chair and chair of the Detroit Empowerment Zone Development Corporation Board of Directors of Eastern Michigan University Board of Regents, similar to the Board of Governors here at, uh, at Wayne. Um, second Vice Chair and Trustee of the United Health Organization goes on and on and on. And like the other judges here, has been greatly honored. I haven't even gotten into the list of honors for fear your eyes will start glazing over. <laughs> but she's well known, well respected, does an incredibly important job, and I'm anxious to have you hear from Judge Donna Robinson Milhouse. Thank you, Justice Kelly. I guess I'll Go ahead. follow my colleagues <laughs> up to the podium. Good afternoon to all of you, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I guess I am the oldest. I graduated 31 years ago <laughs> from this fine institution. I am a lifelong Detroiter. I did go to Eastern Michigan. I wanted to go away, but not too far. And they did give me that tennis belt. Are you a tennis I remember. I think we may have crossed paths in junior tennis. Um, but um, so I was really um, glad to be able to come back to my hometown and attend Wayne State University. I, you know, it's an, an urban school. Uh, I was able to come back home and live with my parents who were trying to transition. My brothers were uh, were away and 
and they talk about, we're going to, you know, we're about to sell the house. And I was in my last year of law school, and I said, well, and we're going to get an apartment. And I said, but you need two bedrooms. I, I have one more year of law school. Um, but I, I love the city uh, and, and committed to it. And so I was uh, very um, glad to be able to attend Wayne State University. I um, really got a lot of confidence here. Um, I did moot court my, uh, the first year. I think, does everyone go through the moot court program here the first year of law Second school? Year. Second year. I think it was, okay, I think it was first for me. But then I made national team my um, last year. Um, and it gave me a lot of confidence. I love to write, but they, I was chosen to be an oralist um, uh, on national team. And that, that gave me a lot of confidence uh, to move forward. Um, know this, that um, this is tremendous support here at Wayne State. But you don't know it all, and really you have to go out and start practicing. I think that's why they call it practice. <laughs> you really have to do that in, in order to really get comfortable. And I know that everyone comes from different backgrounds, but um, I uh, really value my experience here at, at Wayne State. I am also on the board, a recent member of the Board of Law Examiners, which I think all of you will be um, interested in that. And Wayne State has a really, really good, they have a really strong uh, reputation for uh, a passage rate. So Wayne State, you, you're at a fine institution for that. So. Um, uh, so we, I, we just had, I think, um, the February bar exam, and, and everyone gets a little nervous, but really you are at an institution that's going to really prepare you um, to pass that bar exam and get on with your, your uh, professional career. I am also a mother of two young adults. I had my children while I was um, at the law firm of now called Clark Hill. Um, and uh, that went well. Uh, the uh, firm was really understanding. Um, I think I was only the second woman to um, uh, have children while I was still practicing there, but I was able to do that. Um, and then I went on to AAA Michigan um, after 10 years at the firm and, um, and enjoyed my time there. It was five years. I got to use, I have a business degree. Um, so I really got to use that business degree when I was at uh, AAA Michigan, and um, I enjoyed the fact that I had one client, even though there were a lot of different um, departments um, that really came to us for, for uh, information and advice. Um, I liked the fact that there was one client. I love being an advocate, but I really love being the neutral on the bench. I, I um, really had the urge to, <clears throat> to be a judge and, and thought that that would be a, uh, a perfect fit for me because I like uh, getting people to agree and to settle uh, amicably. And um, I, I think those skills are, are really necessary on the bench. And, um, so I leave it to the attorneys to be the advocates, and then I kind of step back and say, I'll go out in the hallway one more time <laughs> and see if you can resolve that. Um, and, and it works. I am doing mostly a civil docket now. I've been on the bench for uh, 15 years and did the whole gamut in circuit. I mean, district. <laughs> in district court. Um, and uh, so from the criminal um, docket to civil to small claims to traffic, uh, but now I'm uh, strictly on the uh, civil docket. That is my background, um, and uh, I, I love that work, um, and it's gratifying every day. Uh, my children um, did not want to follow me in the, <laughs> the legal profession. Um, and they're they're doing fabulously on on their own, but um, but I love it. My husband tries to get my daughter to be uh, a lawyer, and she finally came to me and said, "Will you just tell Dad that I 
really have no interest in the law whatsoever. Don't ask again. But I'm really proud of them. And I say that to say that, um, you know, everyone comes from different walks of life. I, I um, have a family and, and was able to um, do that and have my profession. But really follow your bliss. Uh, my son tells me all the time, he's 26, that I gotta follow my passion, he's really creative. And, and that's really true. Just make sure you're happy at what you're doing. Um, and if that's the case, you'll do well. Thank you. Thank you. I think you make a really good point, Judge Milhouse, about following your, your whatever your inner passion is. Um, I have seen uh, judges take the bench, and, and I expect all of you have too, who were really wonderful advocates. They loved to advocate one side. And they got on the bench and they were terrible. They just simply had a terrible time in sitting back, giving up the advocacy role, and taking on the role of listening to everybody, not jumping to conclusions, and keeping their mouths for the most part shut until they get to the point where they can and, and uh, should make a wise decision. So, but if you, like Judge Milhouse, and me too, frankly, um, feel inside you that what you really like is the idea of hearing both sides and then making a decision on where the law is and where it ought to be going, possibly, um, then maybe judging is for you. In any event, let me prime the pump here with a first question and ask uh, our judges to respond in the order that they presented. Uh, what's the largest, what was the largest obstacle on the, your path to the bench and how did you overcome it? Um, you know, I, I was kind of the, the opposite of Judge um, Brennan in the sense that I thought I was going to be an English teacher. I come from a family of teachers and I'm a frustrated um, teacher even now as a judge. Um, so, and that's probably why I love the juvenile drill court so much, because there's so much like teaching in those court sessions. Um, so I never intended, quite frankly, to um, be a lawyer. Then when I became a lawyer, I didn't intend to be in the courtroom. So it's like, um, I get, one piece of advice I would have for you is listen to what other people say about you, um, because I thought the same thing. I thought I was going to um, be doing reading and, and, and writing, um, rather than being in the courtroom, and then I did my first year um, appellate brief oral argument and got feedback that suggested that I should do something else. So, um, <laughs> no, I meant, besides writing, that I, it was a great night, and, and they said, no, think about being in the courtroom. So my point being, I stood there just getting through it and then really changed my course a little bit. Um, I didn't have an intention of running for judge until People, there was an opening and people started to say, um, you would be good at that, you have a good temperament for that, would you consider that? Um, so I guess in terms of the um, imp impediment, it would just be the election process. Um, and um, I don't, I grew up with not much in terms of uh, money, and uh, so I didn't have that type of, uh, of background in, in the ability to raise a lot of money. Um, so in terms of me being elected, it was people, and it was um, getting, you know, inexpensive things, balloons and people and going everywhere and having coffee um, with people everywhere because I didn't have the ability to, to kind of fund that. So in terms of an impediment of where I am today, I would say um, it would be just the election process, but we got it done. I would say the biggest impediment for me was, like, mentally, um, well, timing, first of all, when would be the right time when you have all these, you have a family, I have four children, and you know, at every stage it seemed like, no, this isn't the time to do it, it's not the time. I was always thinking about their needs, and, and so it was, uh, I think, taking that leap and making that decision is something I wanted to do, and I thought I was going to do, and I, was, I felt like I was, I could be good at it. But even though you think all those things, you, you tell yourself, oh, it just seems very selfish to do that at this time. You know, I have one entering high school. I mean, they, she's going to need me. So not that you had more time when I was practicing. It's just different. You have other pulls on you when you're a judge. You have a lot of, um, I mean, there's a lot of, 
not just being on the bench, you have to prepare a lot, and there's a lot of administrative duties that we all have to do. And um, one of the things that when Judge or when Governor Granholm appointed me, she said, "I want all of my judges, whoever I appoint, out in the community." And I took that to heart, and I, I was already involved, but I became more involved in the county system of Philly. So it's a big commitment, and you have to be mentally prepared for it, mentally ready for it. And I, you know, I waited. I think I, you know, I was 40 when I decided that this was the time. I wasn't. It wasn't something I jumped into <coughs> randomly. I had had a lot of broad experience, so I felt like I could really contribute. I had done a lot of different kinds of practice, and I'd seen good lawyers and not so good lawyers, and I wanted to be a good judge, and I had observed a lot of judges in my practice, so I thought, okay, I'm, I'm ready to do it. So I think the biggest obstacle, obstacle for me was getting mentally ready and getting enough courage and, and, and jumping in. So. I do call here, I'll just stay down here. Um, I think had the impediment that, that you may think because I actually followed Judge Milhouse's advice is I always followed my bliss, my passion. Um, even having been the daughter of a judge, I did not think I was going to go into law school. I really thought I had other um, visions for myself until what I always tell the story when I was my junior year in college and I called my dad there on vacation, my, my mom, and I said, I'm going to, I'm applying to law school. So I'll let you know I really, this is what I want to do. And, Dad says, oh, that's fine, great, click. Oh, by the way, I have two, doc two brothers who are doctors, so this is, this is his only chance. So, but he hung up on me, and I was kind of taken aback, and I called my mom, and I said, Dad seemed really not so hot about me applying to law school. And she says, oh, no, he's over in the corner crying, he's so hot. <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, but um, I would say, um, if you can tell from what I'm saying, I would think my biggest impediment was my age. Because even though I went straight through um, college, I went straight to law school, I went straight into private practice, so I had, a, I believe, a wealth of experience. <coughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, I was 32 when I decided to run for judge. I'll be 51 in two weeks, do the math. So it's, it's, it was interesting what I found, because, and with all due respect to Judge Brennan, she knows what I might say, is I was also running against a man named John O'Brien. If you live in Oakland County and you have an Irish last name, you don't have to have a lot of money to run <laughs> because you're, you're usually going to be elected. So when I was, as, so as a woman without an Irish last name, I was told this isn't going to happen. And I said, well, that's fine. I'll work really hard that I did the same thing. I, my husband and my parents tell the story that literally there was like five people, you know, talking in a parking lot. I would pull over. I, that's not a joke. I would pull over and hand out a pen and start talking to them. And this, again, before the internet, this is before you had all these other things you can, you can get out to people. Um, the reason I'm telling you my age was because I found that the biggest it, it, um, problem was every single newspaper article that was written about the election, every single opinion article that was written about the election, always said Nancy Grant, comma, 32, and her opponent, John O'Brien. John O'Brien was only three years older than I was. They never mentioned his age. So I always thought that was fascinating when people would meet me, and they're like, I said, well, and I was really good to say, well, come meet John. And then <laughs> they would see that it wasn't like you're choosing between a, a neophyte and, and some withered old man. <laughs> but I thought that was there, was, there was a lot of, I don't think they would try, it was very sexist, let's just call it what it is. Um, but it, and I found that to be the biggest issue, which I don't think you would see at this point. Um, I was appointed first, um, and I probably put in for vacancies um, to the bench, and I think it was 20 vacancies for circuit court and for district court, and I, I probably was doing that for five years, and getting the Dear Jane letters, <laughs> um, but also getting good feedback, and I, I also did receive within that time an appointment to uh, my alma mater, uh, Board of Regents, Eastern Michigan University. And so I knew, okay, you're, you're kind of looking. But honestly, you know, I don't know what to even say. You just have to be in a place and feel good either way. So it wasn't like, I have to get this, I have to get this. Just I'm gonna try this. You know, I think I'd be really good at that. Um, and 
I just kept persevering, just kept putting in, doing my job, uh, but kept, you know, putting in for vacancies, and then ultimately it happened. And uh, in 2000, and um, I was I was semi shocked. I mean, after I got the appointment to uh, the Board of Regents, I kind of knew that oh, there are kind of things that you really cannot predict these things. So you know, you just do the best you can. Feel comfortable where you are, feel good where you are until the change happens. And it happens as, as one of the judges read it said, <laughs> it happens at the, at the time it's supposed to, if, if that's what you want. And um, so think of yourself as a whole person. You're not just your profession. Um, and while this, this is uh, a wonderful goal, you're not just that. Advice on law for you, perfect. Um, tell us, um, are there any classes or organizations that you recommend that the students here get involved in if they wish to involve themselves in the life of public service? I really had to work in law school. I, I have to say, I went to my child's high school in Dearborn, went to Michigan State University. When I had to buckle down though, when I had to like, choose a night to go out, either Friday or Saturday, um, it was here. So I put a lot of my, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to move back home and my parents like totally arranged the house around quiet and study time and all that kind of thing. Um, I, but I mentioned uh, Professor Flamenco's evidence class for a reason though, because that was um, one of those things that I mean it. I, I, I always read, one of the pieces of advice he gave us is before you're going to try a case, as in he was saying in, in the sense of preparation of it being an, an attorney, read through the rules of evidence. I have never tried a case, either as a judge or as a lawyer, without reading through the rules of evidence ahead of time. Part of it, I think, is like ritualistic now. It's like being a quarterback and you have to like do a weird <laughs> stuff from here. But I, now I have to read the rules of evidence because I don't feel like I'm prepared, completely prepared until I read it. So even as a judge, if I know something's gonna go, I read through the rules of evidence again. So that, to me, the amount of effort I put in, and he was absolutely phenomenal expert on evidence. And it has, um, it's my one, I would say it's my strongest area of comfort in the courtroom, is knowing that I have a sense of those rules. So that, to me, putting effort in those types of classes that are going to be key, no matter what kind of law you're practicing, or how you end up in terms of uh, using your degree, that, for me, was really key. Was this question, Chief, about a class that might help them in practice, or I'm not sure? It could be an undergraduate class or a law school class. Oh, all right. Well, I would say, the, for me, the number one most important thing I learned was to write well and clearly. So I'd say, and I'm, I'm, in that law, I think none of my first year teacher for legal writing here, but she was amazing. She was from Dickinson, she was an adjunct teacher, fantastic. She ripped up my writing. <laughs> from the get-go, but I took out all that passive voice. I mean, it, she just taught me so much. I mean, and I think, and I got that here. And I, I still consider that to be the most important course I've ever had, was that legal writing class. So, that's my that's a good one. I like that one. <laughs> I, I, I like the legal writing because it, whether you're going to be a practicing attorney or not, it will be helpful in your life, period. So legal writing. Um, and I love con law too. As I don't know if you still call it the sex of con law. <laughs> <laughs> it's the more interesting of the two. Con, and I had um, Joe Grado. So he, oh, oh, he, he was fabulous. He, he basically promises that we got, if we slug through con law one, we would be rewarded with con law two. And that was the really boring stuff, even though that was the most important basic stuff. Um, but I would say between legal writing and um, actually, if you take any of this, I, I assume they still do them. In my second, especially my third year, where they had those small eight person seminars with just a professor, where mine was antitrust, I loved it. And there's things I learned in that class that I still use to this day, including real, wor real world applications and learning how all this applies out there, and at least that's what we did. And just also learning 
better how to communicate with everyone in that small room instead of just sitting in a lecture and having this information just thrown at you. That, that would be my recommendation. Legal writing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. Um, I love to write. Um, I don't get that much of an opportunity as a district court judge, but I have about four big binders of opinions and um, findings of facts and conclusions of law that I've written because I like to do that. <laughs> and then if it's ever, you know, challenged or appealed, then we've got something right there in writing that really explains uh, my thought uh, process in terms of ruling on an issue. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So you reminded that an appeal from the district court decision goes to circuit court, right? And from there it goes to court of appeals. Oh my God, right. seriously, people? <laughs> <laughs> One more question for me and then I will open it up to you. And then, of course, the Supreme Court. Um, what irritates you most about the behavior of lawyers who appear before you in court or about the written pleadings that they present to you? Do we have that kind of time? For me, it's dishonesty. Dishonesty, dishonesty. Because what people don't realize is I am going to remember. I'm going to remember. No motion, no moment in time is worth compromising your integrity in front of the judge because I make a mental note. I have to fact check that person. I can't now believe what they tell me. So for me, I don't want more work. I don't want to have to fact check. I don't want to have to follow up. I want to be able to take lawyers at their word. Um, so reputation, I think, is so important. And if you think of it like the same way when you went to college, the, 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 our profession is huge, and there's a million people doing it a million different ways. But it's the same as when you go to college. The campus was huge, but then you start to get in your core of study, then you get in your dorm, and it's your floor, and everything starts to get smaller and smaller. That's the same thing that's going to happen when you get out in your professional life. You're going to be seeing the same people. Um, you're going to be working with the same people. So your handshake has to mean something. Your reputation is so valuable, and people love judges and other lawyers love working with people that they can trust, that, um, that their word is, is valuable. So uh, that, that is the one thing that I think drives me crazy. And when I know it's happening, I'm like, why are you doing this right now to yourself? It's not worth it. Don't die on that hill. Why would you die on that hill? Just, you know, there's nothing for your professional integrity. Because you also don't know what, what you're going to be doing tomorrow. You are making an impression in that courtroom on everybody who is seeing you and hearing you. And, you know, you don't know where your life is going to lead. And you've heard us all describe so many different experiences. And then I left here, and then I went there, and then I did this, and then this opened up for me. Um, so you want to be that person of integrity for moment one all the way through your career. So important. <coughs> I have just two points to make, and I agree with Judge Brennan on that. Um, when we receive briefs, sometimes, I know lawyers are busy, but they're, sometimes we'll get briefs where, might cite some law, but then they don't apply it. They just tell you this is, and maybe that's in criminal court because they're, they're so busy and the lawyers are doing so much, but I, I'd like to have this. The lawyers are supposed to bring the law and apply the facts to that law and make their argument. Very often we don't get that, and every time you should file something, it should be just like they teach you in first year. You should list the issue and the rule, apply it, and conclude your position. We don't get it, and you know it seems so basic, but we don't get that every very much. <laughs> At least I know you get it in the Supreme Court, but maybe not in the trial court. No, we used to say all the time, "I would love to be able to get the brief that you." I know you're going to write to the court. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's I have true. that brief. Yeah. The other point I want to make, and I, um, I um, in, I'm now in the criminal court, but even this applies to you. Lawyers who are just 
good people who can, you know, we're just trying to do our job. Our job. We have to make decisions. You want us to make the decisions and make it for us. Take the rule we give you and don't argue with us. That's one of the things we have in the trial court. And maybe that's, um, you know, Judge Kenny is our chief, chief judge for the, the presiding judge for the criminal division. And recently I had an experience with a lawyer who had been around for a long time. While the jury is there, and I called him up and said, Stop doing that. Please do not repeat. It's disrespectful. Kept doing it. So after the trial was over, at the end of that day, I went to the presiding judge and I said, Does he, this lawyer give you any trouble? You know, like argue with you? I've known him for 35 years. He's never done that to me. So, you know, you got to wonder, you know, sometimes your personalities may not mix or this person may have something against you. But just but the people, the lawyers that are just kind and just do their jobs and you know take the judge's ruling and you know say thank you, Your Honor, and move on because you can appeal it. You make a mistake, take it up. That's what I always say. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, yeah, I always try to give reasons for my rulings. But I think the lawyers that are calm in court and are respectful at all times, they feel they they present confidence to the jury and to the judge in their position. Stay calm. I guess, in, in a lot of ways, I would echo what, what the Brennan judges have said. <laughs> we're start on that and we'll yeah. um, except I think, if you think about it, we're all saying the same thing, and that is um, professional courtesy. I expect you to do, you expect me to do a correct ruling, I expect you to give me the, the law, I expect you to write well, I expect, but um, because I'm chief, need to, uh, all the courts have, all the courts in this state have two times during the year that they swear in new lawyers. It's usually sometime in May and sometime in November. But because I'm chief, I use, I also swear in people almost every week because those people who have appealed if there's been something going on in a certain state. So I find that I probably know, quite frankly, I probably know the oath better than anybody up here except for maybe the justice because I say it every week. And the very last line of the oath is, um, and do you swear to perform yourself uh, both personally and professionally, the high standards and conduct imposed on members of the bar to be a lawyer in the this, in this state bar in Michigan. And that one's like, yes, right. I take that seriously. I do. I conduct myself in my personal life, which drives my children crazy when they're growing up because there's a behavior I expect, it. and I conduct myself that way professionally. And I find that if you don't do that, if you don't conduct yourself personally and professionally with the high standards, there is an issue. I tell you this not just because it annoys me when I see attorneys that come in front of me on some motion, which they're allowed to do on some discovery motion. I am more, my job is to help you resolve it. But when I realize you are not talking to each other and you are literally being inappropriate with each other just because you can or just because you think you're being an advocate and what you're really doing is being a jackass, you know? And here's the other thing. My husband's a practicing attorney. He comes home and tells me He's smart enough not to name names, but he tells me issues he has with other lawyers. And it's usually coming down to, the lawyers are ignoring emails, they're ignoring a phone call, they don't want to talk. My husband usually actually went to Wayne County Circuit on Monday morning on an SD motion, summary disposition motion, dispositive motion. The other side didn't show up because they just figured, oh, well, we'll settle this eventually. Except my husband's sitting there, he's written it with no response, the judge wants to know what's going on, but my husband gave the guy a call, and the guy's, the attorney said, courtesy, well, let's just enter a consent judgment. And he says, okay, but I'm, and he says to the circuit judge, I don't want you to rule, even though I think he would have won. He's like, I'd rather have the consent judgment. That's just the dumbest thing. My husband was calling him all weekend long saying, what is going on, can you tell me? And he ignored it. Professional courtesy is everything. Your integrity, everything. Um, and, and that's what it's always gonna come down to. Just like you are, I agree. <laughs> My pet peeve are attorneys who are just courteous to each other in front of me. And and I, I tell them stop. You know, that doesn't move me at all. And um, just recently, you know, I told him, I said, Mr. Smith, it's not like Mr. Thomas sued you personally. You're representing your clients. I appreciate you're trying to represent them zealously, but you're not doing your clients any better than it. And I'm telling you, that, that it's settled like five minutes later, but they, they all
almost, I mean, he was just going at it like this. I can't take it. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, and I think it's because your job, the reason you're there is to try to come to a decision. Yeah. If you have to come to a decision on the case, you don't want to hear all this bickering. What you want is what you need in order to make your decision, right? I felt the same. Mm -hmm. Well, these are excellent observations. Let me open it up to you then for the remaining minutes, and let's hear what questions you have. We did. Yes. <laughs> Nothing went out of that firm without seeing two or three sets of eyes. So I think the supervision you got and the training that you received, you always mentioned with a you know, more experienced lawyer in everything. That's a benefit. I think that's a very big benefit. So you really picked up a lot of tips from you know, the supervision that you received there. If you go into a smaller firm, you may not have time because you're all busy all the time and you're, you just, you know, it's just different. But I think that's one of the advantages that you have. I, I think the word you're looking for. I will tell, and for me, frankly, not only I have the menu system, but because I, I flew, I was at U.S. the associate when I was sent to Papano Beach, Florida, July 4th weekend. That sucked. <laughs> <laughs> but you get those experiences that you can't normally get in a, in a smaller firm, or you certainly don't get them in a, but I mean, if you went to like a prosecutor's office, you're still going to get that same sort of mentoring system, because they, they also have those built-in checks. So, but the nice thing about the law firm is the whole, there's someone you can always ask a question to, literally within the feet of your office door. And observe, too. Mm -hmm. You can go to court and watch them. And there's a lot of advantages that way. So there are other places where you can get that kind of country. And if you go out on your own, I know the Open Time Bar Association has a mentoring program where they hook you up. You want to be on your own, you can. And they'll hook you up with someone who's more experienced and tell you what you need and you can call them and help you out. Yes. Your Honors, thank you very nicely done today. My question is, and I've always had a curiosity, is how do you have to gear your mindset if you're in a, in a uh, hearing or a trial and there's an attorney on one side, but there's a pro se or unrepresented defendant or even plaintiff on the other side? As judges, what do you do to prepare yourself to uh, be, you know, to, to achieve what your goals are? Well, it's hard to, I'll give yeah, it to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it, for me, it's like balance, balance, balance. Um, do I lend them some assistance? I, I, I candidly, yes, because um, they may not have any idea. For example, like in a child custody action, I've got to consider 13 factors. They're called best interest factors, and I have to make findings of fact or that they don't apply on all of those factors. Somebody who doesn't have a lawyer with them is going to have no idea that I have to hear certain types of testimony. So in that case, do I guide the questioning a little bit? I do. I don't know if other people handle it the same, but I, I, I would be not being truthful to say that that doesn't matter. I handle it, I, whether they're represented or not represented. I conduct myself the same way. That would be that is not true. I have to recognize that they they have to. I always tell them you're absolutely entitled to represent yourself, but you have to follow the rules of evidence. And but I I do. I'm I'm keenly aware of the fact that they're not represented. And I try and I, I just, it's like balancing justice, justice, justice. Because it's also not fair to the other side who does have a lawyer for the judge to be, you know, I'm not making objections or anything like that. But if I hear something coming in that I that I know shouldn't, and the other lawyer knows really shouldn't, I'll put a stop to that. That's how I handle it. But we have a ton of folks representing themselves. We do too. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I just try to make, I always say, I can't even do what I say, I can't help you, but I try to explain the process, and um, and I try to explain my rulings, and sometimes they're, they may be combative, but if they are, I say, please, please seek legal advice, um, but this is my ruling, and this is why I'm ruling this way, um, 
and usually people are accepting of that. And I, and I also give them the pro se litigant, everyone. I really give them enough time to really explain um, their position. And a lot of times, especially the pro se litigant, just wants to be heard. Um, well, at least you took, they come out of the way, but at least you took the time to hear what I had to say. And a lot of times, they're saying things that have nothing to do with the price of I wanted to answer that in one way. Uh, Chief Justice Kelly, when she was on the Supreme Court, spearheaded with the task force, the self help, the solutions right. of the self help right. task force, which I went to promote. I mean, I was lucky enough to be on that um, part of that whole process. It was a two year process from 2010 to 2012. Really important. Now we can refer self help. You know, representing people to their website, Michigan Law Health, Michigan Legal Health, mm -hmm. as well as the self help centers. That all came out of the task force that the chief did at the time and spearheaded, and it was great. So now people have a resource, at least a starting point for those kinds of things. Thank you for your service, Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, we're going to have to break. As you know, this room need, is needed for another class, but our panelists will talk with you if you wish, one on one in the hallway. I want to thank them again for the excellent <coughs> presentations and insightful personal presentations they made.